good. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Wendy, thank you for having me. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to be in this mix here. Um, and thank you to, to Peter and to, to SFU. Um, it's an honor, honor to be here. I'm going to talk today uh, about America. I'm an Americanist. Um, and these days, that's kind of an embarrassing thing to say. Um, but we're going to go there together. And we're going to start with the great communicator, Ronald Reagan. Back in 1989, you may remember that Reagan had just come down from office. It was a few months before the Berlin Wall um, was about to be taken down, or about to crumble. And he went to London. And he addressed um, about 1,500 British notables in the historic Guild Hall. And he said that we were entering, quote, a new era in human history, an era of peace and freedom for all. The Goliath of totalitarianism, he announced, will be brought down by the David of the microchip. I believe that more than armies, more than diplomacy, more than the best intentions of democratic nations, the communications revolution will be the greatest force for the advancement of human freedom that the world has ever seen. Now, of course, today we know better, but many of us really didn't know better in the early 90s. And the question I want to address today is why? Why and how did we come to believe that the decentralization of communication technologies would free us? How did we come to believe that the spread of the ability to broadcast individual experience and individual voice at a global scale would render us more collaborative, more equal, more fair? Most importantly, how did we come to think that the public sphere should consist of personalized voices, voices speaking their individual truths, and that the individual truth of experience, one's personal experience, should in fact be the foundation of our political order? You know, Nicholas Negroponte, um, who led the $100 laptop project we heard mentioned in the last session, um, announced in 1995, quote, true personalization is upon us. Like a force of nature, the digital age cannot be denied or stopped. Hmm. Um, the irony that I've been working on lately, and it's the irony that I want to address today, is a, is a kind of deep cultural irony in America. In the mid-century, we believed that fascism was founded on the ability of leaders to use media to massify populations. And I want to argue today that the things we did, the steps we took, to demassify our communication system have in fact opened us to a new mode of authoritarianism, a highly individualized mode of authoritarianism, a mode of authoritarianism in which those on the extreme right are using precisely the tactics that we in the 1960s on the left used to protest centralization, but now to produce a more racist and more divided society. So I'm going to proceed in three questions. Where did the dream of digital democracy come from? And the short answer for anyone who knows me is always cybernetics. Um, <laughs> um, how does that dream enable authoritarians today? And then briefly at the end, where do we go from here? And I feel especially um, good to be giving this talk in Canada because um, one of the answers for where we could go from here is Canada. <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's start, let's start with the dream of cybernetic democracy, and let's go, begin by going back to World War II and the American context. So in the late 1930s, Americans faced a quandary. Until that time, most American intellectuals, political leaders, and others believed that despite World War I, Germany, even more than France, was the home of cultural leadership, intellectual leadership, European expertise. It was the place that had brought us Beethoven and Goethe, and it was, it was really the home of high European culture. So the question was, how had this most cultured of nations follow, fallen under the sway of a dictator like Adolf Hitler, former clerk, bad artist, um, self-evident madman? How had that happened? And you know, today we might say it had to do with economics and the Weimar um, Republic and its chaos, but at the time, I would argue that most Americans actually believed something different, especially in elite circles. They believed that Hitler had mastered the mass media and that mass media themselves had properties that were conducive to authoritarian societies. So two versions of the story here, and I wanted you to see this picture. Um, this is a, a, an illustration from the Rural Electrification Association um, administration of 1935, I believe, 35, 37. 
And you can see that there's a, a, these beams of radio extend all the way out to rural houses, and they're enormously powerful. There's a fear in this period, a period that has just discovered Freud. Freud has just been through the United States on his first American tour, that mass media take the message of a single source, beam it down right through the walls of your personal defenses, right past your reason, into your unconscious. And having stirred your unconscious, they render you vulnerable and attracted to leaders. Leaders who have a kind of one-to-many power. And this becomes especially problematic when leaders like Hermann Goering there on the right are, as many believed they were at the time, clinically insane. So you might want to start to follow these kind of madmen. Now, one of the things that I found in my research that really surprised me was um, that there were actually four fascists routinely described in the press in this period. Uh, Tojo, Mussolini, Hitler, and Franklin Roosevelt. Now, I'm serious. Franklin Roosevelt was frequently called the fourth fascist in places like you know, the Saturday Evening Post. Um, why? Well, um, he was called that because people were afraid that through his fireside chats, he had found a way to enter the psychic lives of Americans at home, to penetrate their domestic defenses, and recruit them, recruit their emotions, in service of his vision of a deeply centralized American state. And this is the fear. The fear is that we're going to centralize American life and we're going to produce fascism at home. A little bit more context. Don't forget that in the late 30s, fascism was a very visible thing here in the United States. 1939, 22,000 Americans rallied for fascism under a banner that said, stop Jewish domination of, of, of Christian Americans in Madison Square Garden. In 1939, after Hitler went into Poland, after he went into Poland, a thousand Americans marched down East 86th Street in New York in their own homemade brown shirt uniforms carrying swastikas and American flags, and they were not booed. They weren't cheered, but crowds watched quietly. Um, I, you may not know, as I didn't know, that there were Nazi summer camps on Long Island in the 30s. Um, yeah. Whole families could go and learn the salute. The point being that mass media seemed on the verge of triggering a kind of subconscious fascism that was alive in American society in this period and giving it real political power. And so a whole series of folks during and right after the war began theorizing decentralized modes of propaganda and communication um, to defeat that centralized mode. Um, I've told that history at length elsewhere. I'm gonna jump now to one of its descendants which radically impacts our own time and that is cybernetics. So cybernetics, a toy, ter, ter, blah, 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 term coined by Norbert Wiener, um, himself a military industrial researcher, a mathematician, a prodigy at MIT um, during the war years, and he called it the science of communication and control. And in 1950, he published this book, The Human Use of Human Beings, to make his ideas accessible to the public. It was a bestseller at the time, and as the cover of this second edition shows, cybernetics was a model of a world based on feedback. You were thought to be like a feedback system. You would go out, get feedback from the world. You'd walk along, you'd bump into the wall, change direction. The wall would give you feedback. The world that Wiener described was one very much like Friedrich Hayek's neoliberal world, a world in which individuals sought their way, made their way, bumped into one another, interacted with one another, and order simply emerged. And for Wiener and many, his, the many fans of cybernetics, this vision was radically anti-fascist and explicitly anti-fascist. And for our own time, we want to be alert here to the connection between fascism and hierarchy. You know, all through the 1990s, people promoting the internet said, it's great, we're finally going to tear down hierarchies. That vision of tearing down hierarchies as a democratic project is actually born during and just after World War II. And here's Norbert Wiener from the book, Our View of Society, Cybernetics' View of Society, differs from that of the fascists, those who have strong men in business and in government. Such people prefer an organization in which orders come from above and none return. I wish to devote this book to a protest against the inhuman use of human beings. For Wiener, the ideal society was a technocracy, one in which a group of experts could build a technical system to monitor, manage, receive feedback, and yet keep people who lived within that arena independent, free, and sort of free information seekers. You could be free in the world 
as long as the experts were carefully managing the surroundings, giving you the technologies to communicate with one another, to share information, to seek and receive and give the feedback on which social order depended. Norbert Wiener's vision became key to the American counterculture. Now, I was raised on stories of the counterculture being radically anti-mainstream America, radically anti-military, and parts of it certainly were, especially the new left during the Vietnam era. But the commune movement of the 1960s was, in fact, um, deeply in love with cybernetics and its vision of invisible systems of information that might connect us. In fact, as some of you, I'm looking out, not enough gray hair in the audience, um, too bad. Um, if there were, you would be the people who would likely remember the time when LSD was a gateway to a cybernetic insight that the world was in fact a, system, a, a set of invisible systems that could be made visible through the dropping of acid. Um, this is such a sober crowd. <laughs> Let's just pause on that. Um, so, so commune movement was huge. Between 1966 and 73, three quarters of a million Americans went back to the land. They left their homes and they moved into places like this. This is Drop City in Trinidad, Colorado, about 1965. And what they tried to do was take technologies produced by mainstream industrial worlds, by technocracy, and build them into houses and other systems that would let them escape politics. So the hope here at Drop City was that we no longer needed bureaucracy. We no longer needed hierarchy. In keeping with Norbert Wiener's cybernetic vision, we could build round houses, develop rounded out, collaborative, flexible ways of working together, and that we would build a better society in the process. Now, of course, here's the rub. When you take away bureaucracy, you take away rules and the ability to explicitly negotiate difference, what you end up with is charisma, rule by cool. You end up with systems in which dominant groups, say men, start oppressing less dominant groups, women. You start ending up with, and many of the communes went this way, radically heteronormative white societies that are not explicitly discriminatory. Oh, we can't say, you know, I actually heard this example that I'm about to give. We don't actually say um, black people are prohibited here. It's just, you know, they're different. They're not really cool. And suddenly you have these kind of exclusive and excluding societies built around charismatic culture. Um, these societies didn't last very long. Um, it turns out that if you weren't in an authoritarian commune or a religious commune, you didn't have sufficient structure and order to keep it all working, usually for more than a year or two. And by 1973, virtually all the communes had disappeared. Yet their memory has lingered in Silicon Valley. This is Mark Zuckerberg's tent at Burning Man. Um, I don't know how many of you have gone to Burning Man. Burning Man is a countercultural festival um, in the desert in Nevada. Draws about 75,000 people a year now in, in deep heat. And it's a site at which um, lots and lots of people from Silicon Valley um, practice the cybernetic ideal of collaborative community, um, technology-oriented art making, um, in a world that they imagine is beyond government and beyond control. I'm going to argue now, turning to the present, um, th that this is in fact a gateway to the new style of authoritarianism that we have. And this is what authoritarianism looks like today. Um, it wears a t-shirt, it's pretty good looking, it's kind of cool. Um, but but don't, don't get it wrong, this is authoritarianism. You know, Facebook is in one sense a model of the kind of sociability and the kind of social system and the kind of governance that Norbert Wiener called for. It makes possible the expression of individual truth at scale. It allows you to send out a message into the world, to receive messages from others, to seek feedback, give feedback, and make order in the process. It literally facilitates the technology-enabled sharing of consciousness. Now, I've spent a lot of time recently inside Facebook. Um, I wrote a paper about their art collection. It's actually one of the largest in the world. And their art collection is housed entirely inside the, the buildings of the company. And much of it is literally a replication of 60s styles of art. Um, they, have a, they have a radical postering program, which I especially love. Um, they, they do these letterpress posters. Um, when I was signing my last NDA, my non-disclosure agreement, as I entered the headquarters in Menlo Park, uh, directly above that place um, was a big red and white poster that said, be open. 
And that's kind of how things work in this new world. Um, Facebook has the kind of global reach that Norbert Wiener would have celebrated, but it's also, of course, a privatized space, one in, one in which total surveillance occurs, and one in which social life is mined and remarketed um, as if it were oil or coal dust. Zuckerman, Zuckerberg himself, I would argue, is a, is a new species that we haven't really had a name for before, but which I will name the authoritarian engineer. The authoritarian engineer is someone who leverages the democratic dreams of Norbert Wiener and the counterculture, um, but builds a system uniquely to their own advantage in which human beings become resources for their enrichment. If you look at Facebook and if you go to Facebook and if you listen to Zuckerberg, you will hear, I want to build a system of global interconnection. Well, that's fine. That's the, that's the dream of, that's McLuhan's dream. That's the dream of the 1960s. It's the dream of universal humanism in the 1940s. But if you look a little closer, say at the annual reports, you'll notice that there's a, a two-tier stock structure. And the two-tier stock structure guarantees Zuckerberg absolute control in perpetuity of corporate policy, as well as an entirely different range of profit. And this combination of working state systems, say disclosures around stock, while invoking public communal collective systems that as being opposed to and beyond the state, that's how the new authoritarianism gets its mojo. The alt-right knows this. The alt-right has been very, very uh, busy lately, um, borrowing the styles of the counterculture um, and the architecture of the cybernetic revolution of the mid-century uh, to do its business. This is Richard Spencer, who sparked that riot you saw in Charlottesville. And look at his language. His language is straight out of the commune movement of the 1960s. We're really trying to change the world by changing consciousness and by changing how people see the world and how they see themselves. That project of changing your consciousness, changing how you see yourself, that was the project of second wave feminism. That was the project of gay rights. This is the Daily Stormer, um, published in my own hometown of Mountain View, California. Um, one should study the ways that Jews conquered our culture in the 1960s writes the editor in their style guide. They created a subculture by infesting certain elements of the existing culture. That is what we aim to do. We're going to do for the right what the hippies did for the left. And the, the thought behind this is actually very um, self-conscious. Um, there's a real effort to kind of recuperate the um, personal narratives that have become the foundation of left politics, the coming out stories, the um, authenticity accounts, the sense of personal experience um, for right-wing purposes. I'm just going to give you a, a kind of well-known example here. And this is Candace Owens, who is a, a well-known um, right-wing figure. And I'll let her speak for herself. I think we'll have sound. OK. It's, it's slow. It's slow to start. But. Oh, what, 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 hang on. I'm going to go back here to give you a sec. We'll let her make her entrance again. Oh, wait, she's got to speak. She's got to speak. Desk person. I've got mute on my computer, I do? Yeah, in the box. In the box. Okay, in the box. What's the box? Way over on the right there. Way over on the right there. Oh, thank you. My bad. I don't have mute on there. No. I have, I, I'm fine. I, I, everything's fine here. Excuse us. Are you up here? Yeah, that's on. It should oh. just be coming out through the HTML, shouldn't it? No. No, okay. Let's go through. This is the world that Norbert Wiener predicted. <laughs> Not. Hmm. That is working. We're seeking feedback. Hmm. So you can hear it coming out at the, you can hear the speakers are on. Yeah, the video is not. Correct. Yeah. I can just narrate it too. I mean, rather than you know, go too long on this. Yeah, it's not. No. There's no audio. I just narrate it. 
Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. All right, we're gonna, we're, you're going to actually get me playing Candace Owens. Um, be patient, okay? I'm going to do the best I can with this. All right, so she comes out. She's in a home setting. She says, Mom, Dad, I'm a lesbian. Oh, honey, this is her mother. Oh, we always knew. It's fine. Oh, that's just fine. This is her father. Oh, baby, we love you just the way you are. Really, we do. And Mom, I got one more thing. One more thing I want to say to you, okay? And oops, she just said it. We'll go back. Um, what she said was, Mom, Dad, I'm a conservative. Okay. And she says, oh, but honey, Mom says, oh, honey, but, but you're black. I said, Mom, Mom, I'm still a conservative. I just think a little bit more conservatively. Her father's like, oh, I knew there were too many white people in that high school. I mean, it goes on from there. It's really wild, okay? The point being that she has actually, and this is a genre now in alt-right YouTubes, um, she's YouTube influencer videos, she's gone on to sort of say, you know, look, that was the coming out story. I'm going to lampoon it and flip it so that I now come out as a conservative, because this is where the real counterculture is today. I want to say here that I'm relying on, on work by one of my PhD students, um, Be uh, Becca Lewis, who's done amazing work in this space. Rebecca Lewis um, done a lot of work um, with a white paper in this space, and I want to really urge you to, to check out her work, Rebecca Lewis. So even Trump himself is not simply taking advantage of a technology that was designed for democratic and individualized expression. He's doing it in a way that borrows from the idiom of authentic personal style that we have pioneered on the left. You know, we, you know, we commentators on the left will say, oh, Trump, he's always out of hand. Surely his followers will see that he's off the charts. He's always emotional. He can't control himself. We don't want him near the nuclear codes. Oh, no, no. On the contrary, for his followers, that's a sign of his personal authenticity. It's a sign of his ability to speak the idiom that we on the left pioneered in the 1960s. You know, back in the 60s, 1969, 1970, long hairs marched on Washington. They presented themselves as authentic, as hippies, as fleshies, as fleshy, as, you know, messy, full human beings with all their emotions right there on the street. That attitude is now living in the White House, but it's living in the White House and speaking from the right. So the question we have is, what's to be done? And there's a temptation. The temptation, I think, for those of us on the left is to continue to believe that if we simply go out into the streets and express ourselves, we will change the world. And nothing could be farther from the truth. Of course we need to continue to express ourselves. Of course we need to continue to make change. Of course, we need to continue to focus on our individual differences and empowering those in the world. But look back at Occupy. Those of us who were engaged in Occupy, and I was not in this particular one, but you go to Zuccotti Park, and you stand together, and you make the human microphone, and you express your truth, and you tell the world, we are the 99%. Well, great. You're the 99%, and you own that meme. Meantime, the right is in the South, in churches, organizing, and they're taking Congress. One of the deepest fallacies on the left, having nothing to do with the internet but dramatically amplified and enhanced by the internet, is that authentic expression of individual experience is the foundation of political life. I disagree. I think if you want a democracy, you speak your individual truth, but you speak it to power, and you don't just speak it to power in the streets, you speak it to power in the institutions that are powerful. You take Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't just need enhanced systems for collective self-expression. On the contrary, as we've seen already today, those things are taking us away from democracy. We actually need to return to things that those of us who celebrated the power of individual voices poo-pooed. We need to return to bureaucracy. We need to return to democratic institutions, to ensuring the power of diverse voting. Heck, I grew up during Vietnam, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but one of the few things standing between us and authoritarianism in the United States right now is the FBI. There's a thing to say. I think that's probably a pretty good place to stop. Thank you. <laughs>